Welcome to this Wise Owl tutorial on tidying up flows using Power Automate. So here's what you'll learn during this tutorial. We'll begin by looking at how you can group actions together using a scope action. Then we'll look at how you can create a parallel branch, not only to improve the efficiency of your flow by uh, executing actions in parallel rather than in series, but also to make it look tidier. We'll then look at how you can annotate expressions to document them. And finally, I'll show you how you can turn on and off an experimental feature with a new expression editor and have a look at whether that's actually worth doing or not. But that's enough of looking at me. I'm going to hand over to my non-avatar persona. And let's get started. So in order to be able to follow along with this tutorial, you'll need to have done the previous one on variables and arrays, but that's a good thing to do anyway. You'll need a really good understanding of variables to carry on with the rest of the tutorials in this series. So what I'd like to do now is to tidy up the flow we got as a result of completing the previous tutorial. And in particular, what I'd like to do is do two things. Firstly, everything in this section is to do with OneDrive. So what I'm doing is getting the list of OneDrive files, collapsing the array, storing that array, and then counting how many items there are in an array. It's all to do with OneDrive. And likewise, if I scroll down a bit, you can see that the next set of four tasks are all to do with SharePoint. So I'd like to do the same thing for that. And what that would do essentially is group the task together into a single, what's called a scope action, which I'll then be able to expand and contract to see the contents. And it's very easy doing this. So let's, let's have a go at doing it. Rather strangely, the way you add a scope action is by adding a new task and then drag everything into it. So I can put this step in anywhere I like. It seems most sensible to do it just above the actions I want to group. So I can click on that and choose to add an action. And what I'm looking for is the unique scope action. So I can add that in. And what I'm inclined to do is to rename that immediately and say it's OneDrive Actions. And then I can simply drag all my tasks in. I don't think from memory there's a way to do them more than one at a time. I think you have to drag them in individually, but I'm nearly there. And now that I've done that, I can collapse it. So I can just click on the title bar and it collapses it and makes the whole flow much easier to read. So now I'm going to do exactly the same thing with the SharePoint ones. I'll add another action. Again, it's going to be a scope and select that, rename it, and this time I'll call it SharePoint Actions, and I can drag all my tasks up into that as well. And again, I don't believe you can do it in a group, but you're welcome to try holding down the control key and seeing if it works, I don't think it does. And you can see my flow is much, much more readable. So I thoroughly recommend scopes to you, but they have one limitation. You're probably screaming at me now saying, why not group all these ones into a scope? So everything up here is to do with setting variables. Why not put those in the scope? Well, it's such an important question. I want to show you why I'm not doing it. So what we're going to do is try adding a scope. I won't bother renaming it because this isn't going to work. And I'm going to drag my first uh, action to set a variable value into the scope. And when I do that, do that, it will come up with a message and say an initialized variable action can only be a top level. It's to do, curiously or ironically enough, with the scope of variables. When you set or initialize a variable, you're creating it, you're declaring it, and it has to be what's called a public variable available throughout the rest of the flow. If you put a variable in a scope, it's only local to that scope and won't be visible elsewhere. If that made no sense, don't worry about it. The upshot is, that when you're initializing variables, you can't put them in a separate scope. And it annoys me intensely because it means I've got to keep these six items at the top setting or six actions initializing variables visible. I won't be able to collapse them down. And so I'm always going to be scrolling down to see the rest of my flow. And there's nothing you can do about that, I'm afraid. So the next thing I'm going to do to improve my flow is to create something called a parallel branch. At the moment, I've got two sets of actions. I'm getting the counting the OneDrive files and getting and counting the SharePoint files, and I'm doing it in sequence. And that doesn't need to happen like that. 
There's no reason why I should do the OneDrive files before the SharePoint files. It would be far better if I gave control to my computer to decide in which order this happens. So what I'm going to do is create a separate path for the SharePoint actions. To add in a parallel branch, you just click above the where you want to create the branch and add a new step and add a parallel branch. And there's two ways you can do this, neither of which quite floats my boat. What I'll do is I'll show you both of them so you can decide for yourself which one you prefer. So the first thing I can do is ignore the fact I'm choosing to add another operation here and drag my SharePoint actions carefully just above it. And providing you've got that little plus symbol appearing on the mouse pointer, which implies I'm copying it even though I'm actually moving it, it will work. What I'm then left with is a residual operation here, which I just need to cancel. So that's one way of doing it, and I'll just quickly move that back if I may. When I move it back, it will get rid of the parallel branch because it's no longer needed. The other way you could do it is to create a parallel branch, and then you could go to your action which you want to move, click on it, and choose to copy to the clipboard. You could then go to the new operation which has been created on the right-hand side, go to my clipboard, and paste that in. What you'll then have to do, though, is to delete the original action and then you'll have to go in and rename the new one you've just created. So on balance, I think the first way is better. So that's how you create a parallel branch. How do you carry on from it? There's two ways in which you can add another step. You can either linger at the bottom of one of these parallel branches and insert a new step. And if you do that, it will be added within the parallel branch. But when you want to reunite them, you need to click at the bottom button here, new step, and that will be added and at the bottom of the flow and reunite your parallel branches. So that's what I'm going to do now. Again, what I need to do now is move this compose task, which brings information from both the two places and put it in my merged flow. So I'm going to drag it there, make sure I've got that little icon for copying and release the mouse button. And once again, I can now get rid of or cancel this last operation. And I've completed my flow. So why is that better? Well, firstly, I think it reads better. It takes up less vertical room in the screen as I scroll up and down, but also it's going to run more efficiently. As I said, I'll leave it up to my computer to decide whether to get information from OneDrive or SharePoint first. It's probably going to be, do both in parallel with what's called separate threads. So if you run this flow, you'll see it runs fractionally quicker than the previous one. So what we'll do now is show a way to annotate expressions to make them easier to read to document your flow. If you look on the OneDrive actions, for example, at the bottom, there's an action to count the number of OneDrive files. And if you expand that, you can see it contains an expression to count the length or get the length of the variable called OneDrive files. The only way I can actually see what that does is to linger over it to read it. It would be nice if I could see it on screen permanently. So this is a way to achieve that. If you click on the expression, the syntax for it will come up in the expression box. And what I can do is copy that, not by right clicking and choosing copy, because that's not supported on a browser, or at least not in this browser. So instead, I'm going to press Control C. You're going to have to take my word that I just did that to copy it. What I can then do is go back to my action and I can choose to add a note to it. We did this briefly earlier in a previous tutorial. So I can add in my short note and I can say count number of one, excuse me, OneDrive files, and then I can put in the expression. It's not a brilliant solution, but it does mean that whenever you're looking at that expression, you can actually see the syntax there. The obvious disadvantage of this is if I choose to change my expression, I need to update my note, note too. So this is really an idea to see if it appeals to you. I'm not saying you should definitely do it, and I'm not actually convinced I'll do it myself it is just a, a thought. So for the fourth and final part of tidying up flows, I'm going to show you something called the experimental expression editor. And really the only way to understand this is to show you. We need to turn this on. And the way you do that is to click on the settings icon at the top right of your flow, that little gear. And it comes up with this list of options. I can choose to view all the Power Automate settings there. And it comes up with this rather odd little floating dialog box. So what I'm going to do is turn my experimental features on. There's actually nothing telling me what's going to happen now. 
Now, when you click on save, what it will do is if you've made changes to your flow, it will say that it's going to reload your website. And what this will mean is you will lose any changes you've made to your current flow. And the reason I know this is I just did this when I was practicing. And that's why the version of this flow you're looking at is subtly different to the one we had at the end of the previous stage of this tutorial, because I've actually gone back and loaded a different version of it because I lost my changes. So that's something to watch out for. So it looks like everything is the same, nothing is different. But let's go into an expression. Let's go back to the one which counted the number of OneDrive files. When you click in the box, you can see something's different. You can see you've got little icons for adding a dynamic value or dynamic content, and there's a shortcut key for that, control space, or adding an expression, shift control space. What you can also see is when you click on the expression, everything's different. So this is a new wizard for adding expressions added by Microsoft. And you can look at formulas, you can look at dynamic values. Uh, it's all fairly intuitive. I think you can see a better description of what all the functions available to you are. Um, and you can click on the FX tool to see a list of functions in a separate web page. Um, I think it's really reasonably intuitive. Is it worth it? This is the sort of thing which, from the training point of view, is a nightmare. Do I teach this using an experimental feature, which may be subsequently discontinued by Microsoft? I think on balance, the advantages it offers aren't great enough to offset the fact that it's an experimental feature which may not survive. So what I'm going to do now is to turn it off. And I can do that by going to settings and just um, disabling it. However, you may choose to use it yourself. You'll be able to follow all of the rest of these tutorials perfectly. It basically does exactly the same thing. It allows you to build up an expression. It just does it in a slightly more friendly way. So I'll leave it up to you whether you leave that turned on or not, but I'm going to leave it firmly turned off from now on.